είναι ταυτόχρονα και νίκη όλων των λαών της Ευρώπης που αγωνίζονται ενάντια στη λιτότητα που καταστρέφει το κοινό ευρωπαϊκό To sit down with our partners with an open mind and rethink this program from scratch. A program which, in our estimation, and I believe in the estimation of most clear thinking people, has failed to stabilize Greece, has generated a major humanitarian crisis, and has made reforming Greece, which is absolutely essential, ever so hard. It'll soon be six months since the Syriza government in Greece came to power amidst a great deal of hope and happiness, uh, not just in Greece but elsewhere in Europe, that at long last in Europe a government opposed to austerity, opposed to uh, the neoliberal capitalist system had been elected. It's not that the hopes were that high. Nobody expected miracles, but very few also expected the degree of chaos that engulfed the government very rapidly after it came to power. And the reason for that is simple. That the European elite, the EU elite, and the American bosses of the financial system decided that despite their differences, the one thing that could not be permitted to raise its head again was any alternative to the neoliberal system. So in my opinion, what has been happening in Greece is not so much a fight over money, because the amount of money is, is actually trivial. The entire Greek debt is virtually the same as the money the world's 20 richest firms make in a single day, just to put it in perspective. So the real question is politics more than economics, and of course the two are linked, but it's the political message and the political example that the EU elite want to crush, because were it to succeed in Greece, then why not Spain, why not Portugal, why not Ireland, and why not these little Balkan principalities of uh, the EU, which are semi-EU colonies, uh, uh, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Slovakia, etc. That is the question that was raised. Some viewers will recall that a day before the election, we interviewed uh, Stavis Kouvalakis, one of the leaders of Syriza, and discussed with him the situation in Greece. Stavis is back with us today to discuss what is happening now. Stavis, um, in your articles uh, and in many other interviews, you have said that at an early stage, had there been a clear alternative plan to what has been happening now, it might have been easier to win over the people to these ideas and to push for a serious alternative. Yes, I think that the question of the plan uh, is absolutely crucial here. And uh, since I agree with what you said in your introduction, Tarek, uh, the, the, the first issue is, you know, how we, we respond to that pressure. And to respond properly, we have to understand properly the type of weapons they have. Uh, this is the first thing, because there are some specificities concerning the, the Greek case. The specificity is that uh, the war that was declared to the Syriza government only days after uh, the elections uh, happened essentially in the terrain, in the field of monetary policy. 
on the 5th of, of February, the European Central Bank opened the hostilities and they cut actually the main channel for financing the Greek banks. The Greek banks and therefore the Greek economy as a whole since February is financed only via an emergency mechanism which is called the ELA which is there only for you know a short period of time only for as an emergency actually and uh, it is given you know the liquidity is provided in, at a very slow pace and you know in a very careful way. So the whole of Greek economy since early February is actually subjected to an enormous pressure. Greece has re-entered recession. The revenue of the state is declining and in the meanwhile Greece has to repay its debt which it did uh, and it is the only country in Europe which is servicing its public debt without any kind of financial aid. Greece hasn't received any financial support, let's call it that way, from the European Union since last summer, since August 2014. The result is that three months and a half after this, uh, the state coffers are nearly empty uh, Greece is at uh, the verge of a default, uh, which in a way should have happened as far as uh, the IMF and the European Central Bank are at stake, but which now may well have happened in a much less sound way, which is that you know the Greek state might be insolvent and unable to pay salaries or wages. Huh? So this pressure and this blackmailing uh, has brought the Syriza government to its knees, has forced this government to make enormous concession in February when it signed the February the 20th agreement with the rest of the Eurogroup actually. Since then the hands of the governments are to a very large extent tied and Syriza is unable actually to implement its program. The economy is deteriorating because of the reasons I've just mentioned. And Greece has to face even more repayments during the summer and even that very temporary and completely unviable uh, arrangement will come to an end very soon. So if uh, no alternative strategy is implemented by the government, then I think that uh, a political disaster might happen quite soon actually. By political disaster, <coughs> you mean the collapse of this government? Let's be clear about the strategy of the, of the EU actually. What they did is first they put that pressure. Then they obtained very serious concession in February with this agreement. Actually they, they got three things. First of all, uh, the Greek government in those agreements recognized the integrality of the debt and committed itself to repay it in full and on time. B, it had to accept the continuation of the supervision by the Troika. The Troika has just been renamed as the institutions or the Brussels group, but the substance remains the same. It's the same mechanism of the so-called reviewing of the Greek economy, which means that those experts and EU bureaucrats come to Greece and check you know, the performance and the results and the extent to which Greece is implementing the so-called reforms, which just means you know, austerity, further austerity, and even more austerity at each time. And third, the, co the government committed uh, itself to uh, submit actually, to, to abstain from any so-called unilateral action that could even roll back the existing arrangement which means putting into question you know, the whole of this austerity framework that has been implemented those five years, and uh, not to take measures that will entail uh, a financial cost, the budgetary targets, the financial stability, and the competitiveness of the economy, which means actually any of Syriza's commitments. So the government has been able to pass very few laws, 
which is a paradox huh, for a government that has been elected actually to change things. Uh, it has passed less than 10 actually laws from Parliament. Very few of them, all, all of them are positive but very timid. And none of the most fundamental commitments of Syriza has been implemented concerning wages, concerning overtaxation, concerning labor legislation, because the Troika doesn't want any of that. This includes uh, the privatization. And the government, shortly after this agreement, via the so-called list of reforms submitted, sent by Yanis Varoufakis, the finance minister, to uh, the Europeans, uh, committed itself to continue fully with the privatization program, although there are conflicting lines about this within the government, within the cabinet itself. Huh? Uh, so very serious concessions have been, ma have been made on the one side, the Greek side, the side of the series of government, and absolutely no concession has been made by the other side. They just relentlessly continue to put pressure until what? Well, until they obtain total surrender, which means not just freezing, you know, the situation, not just preventing Syriza government from implementing its program, but forcing it actually to continue with austerity politics and, of course, destroy it politically, destroy the party, destroy the <coughs> government and destroy the whole experiment. Well, this is exactly what it seems like uh, from abroad. And when you talk to occasionally German or Euro bureaucrats, which I sometimes do, they are very open about it. They are saying that these people are just crazy to think we were going to let them do this. Uh, and of course we are carrying out the policies of the European Union. These are not just German policies. These are policies agreed by the EU as a whole and they are expressed in very sharp language by our finance minister Wolfgang Schobler but don't think we're just speaking for ourselves and I think they're right on that they're the dominant but not they don't represent the whole of uh, the EU and their aim is very clear status it's to destroy the Syriza government so you've had three articles in the Financial Times over the last six months saying the key thing is to expel the left from Syriza I mean what used to be once a respected conservative financial paper intervening in a factional way to say we might do business with you but get rid of these uh, left-wing people, which is not easy because uh, I think if there were a, a large assembly of the party as a whole, they would find a lot of dissent. It's not just a tiny minority. So the result of that is to make the leadership and the government more and more isolated from its own supporters, leave alone the people at large. But still, if they capitulate completely, the, the costs will be very high. That is the end of a unified Greek left for a long time to come, because uh, including sort of factional opponents on the left, but including many other people will say, well, look, you know, we tried this out and they failed. They behaved just like Pasok and even Samaras. You know, what was the point of electing you if you were not able to do anything? And if you were not able to do anything, why didn't you come back and tell us and allow us to decide? Now, there's been some talk of a referendum that they might, at this late stage, say, no, we can't carry out these policies and appeal to the Greek people for a referendum. If there is such a referendum, there's one question. Are you prepared to stay in the Eurozone, whatever the cost? That's the question. If the vote is yes, then, you know, we have huge problems. But I'm not sure that if the case is argued properly, the vote for that will be yes. Yes, with... Uh, I totally agree with, uh, with, you, with your analysis. Uh, we have to understand you know, the reasons for that uh, weakness in the response of the Syriza government. And the reason is that they sincerely thought that it was possible to overturn austerity and remain within the Eurozone. The whole strategy of Syriza was based on separating two things, negotiations on the issue of the debt, and on the other hand, dismantling this framework of austerity in a way unilaterally because it was not submitted to negotiations, the so-called Thessaloniki program, so the core commitments actually of Syriza, it was explicitly said that this, this doesn't depend on negotiations. We will just implement this. But very clearly, 
uh, the, the European Union made it you know, absolutely uh, clear that they are not prepared to accept any of those uh, measures uh, because of the reasons you just mentioned. And this put the whole strategy, of course, into question. And at that point, I think that the government made perhaps an even more serious mistake than accepting those concessions. And the even more serious mistake was that instead of saying to the people, look, we had to make concessions, at that specific moment, let's say in February the 20th, we had no other choice because we were not prepared actually for another scenario, because the banks were on the verge of collapse, because of all that pressure that had been put on us. Uh, but this is a very serious con concession and let's open up the debate to see what we're going to do in the future. Instead of saying this, at the, f at the first stage they said, oh, this is a very good agreement, this is nearly a success, this is the proof that you know, negotiations are possible, that we are going ahead, we have bought time. That was the main argument actually. And now we can see that you know, the time was not on the side of the government, the time is on the side of the lenders on the side of the European uh, Union and the government now admits it. They say we have made a very serious mistake because this agreement didn't provide any guarantee for the provision of liquidities. On the contrary, you know, the pressure continued. But why did they expect to happen otherwise? That's, the, this, this is almost mysterious and I think that the root of the issue, Tarek, is that Syriza, as the rest of the European radical left, feels itself part of the so-called European project, actually. And they are not prepared mentally, in a way, to break uh, at a certain moment with that framework and to put the right question into a possible referendum, which is the one you have just posed, one way or another. Because, you see, there is an ambiguity in Greece currently on this debate about the referendum. Th there are people, you know, there are different motivations actually for, for the referendum. The one motivation is the one you have just mentioned, okay? If we want to go further to follow an alternative path, then of course we need the approval of the people because this was not in Syriza's program exactly. as it was elected. This is true, so we need democratic legitimacy actually to go ahead uh, in that direction. But there are other people who say that, you know, concessions are inevitable what can you do? And concessions in this case just mean total surrender. Right? It's just a fig leaf uh, actually for total surrender. And therefore we need the referendum as just a way to legitimize this surrender to the Europeans. And of course in this case the question will, will be formulated in a completely different way. Huh? The media and the system and all you know, the, the pro-system parties blackmail constantly public opinion by saying you know, it will be either this supposedly a compromise, which is just a fig leaf for surrender, or the apocalypse, because breaking with the euro, possibly as exiting the euro, even doing more immediate things such as defaulting on the repayment of the debt, are assimilated to some kind of total apocalypse, instead of being discussed as rational political choices. No, I mean, this is what is fearful, and I think the, the, what you said about this blind uh, support of the European project without trying to understand what this project has gradually become. It's become an engine of repression against the poor, pushing through austerity measures as designed uh, by the Germans, now followed by the French, the British, everyone, uh, is something that has to be questioned. You know, and the problem is this, that if the left doesn't provide a critique of the existing European Union and how it functions. We are all for Europe, you know, yes, we want one Europe, but on what basis? This is not being discussed. So it's now become part of the common sense of large parts of the left that the people who oppose Europe are the extreme right. And by doing this, you actually hand over all criticism of the EU to the extreme right. So the left is left naked. You know, the, it has not no closed on this question at all. And it's, a, it's now in Britain, for instance, where we are talking, this is going to become a huge problem because there's going to be a referendum. The far right will 
vote against the what I call the extreme center, the mainstream conservatives, Labour, Lib Dems, probably even Greens, will be blindly for Europe. And what of the left? Unless there is some independent left campaign, the left against this Europe, uh, we, we are completely disarmed. And you know, this is a, a huge problem now for the European left. Either you have this sort of semi-Negrian position that Europe is progressive full stop, but why should it be progressive? It isn't. So are we going to say yes to a Europe which punishes Greece, which threatens Spain, which controls Ireland and Portugal, which doesn't allow these smaller countries to do anything? Why should we? Why should I don't want to vote for that? But to even raise it, is a problem and I think you're right this is at the heart of Syriza's uh, uh, problems not to accept I mean no one's even asking Greece to leave the EU we're just saying withdraw from the eurozone Britain after all is not part of the eurozone either you know uh, and uh, operate in a different way that the, the that is the center of any plan B uh, in Greece but it's, it's not happening. So what I fear, Stathis, is we might get the worst of both worlds. We might get a series of government basically capitulating completely, which would lead to a split sooner or later in Syriza. The whole left pretty demoralized, the right triumphant, and you have the next election and the old politics will be back with a vengeance. This is a very serious risk, but we are not there yet. No. So, uh, you know, the hope has not vanished, although the climate is very different, of course, in Greece. Huh? I mean, the, the, the very combative and hopeful mood uh, that prevailed for, you know, nearly a month after the elections uh, dissipated after the uh, agreement of February the 20th, actually. And from that moment onwards, uh, the people are, you know, in, in the kind of wait and see type of things to see, you know, what what is going on with this, those negotiations. And this is not good because it spreads passivity within society. Uh, and uh, however, there was also very strong resistance, I think, inside Syriza uh, to this line of capitulation, uh, not only to its kind of from the, the ranks of its left minority. Uh, which is prepared since long actually for a break with the Euro and the European Union, but even beyond uh, those ranks, uh, people now realize that if we continue further down that road actually uh, at the end of this and quite quickly actually, uh, the disaster will be there, uh, will happen. So I think it is still time actually uh, to open up a different path and the first move should be defaulting. Of I agree with you. And defaulting means, of course, immediately nationalizing the entire banking system, huh? because otherwise, you know, everything will, will collapse. And of course, if you do that, then you are already one foot outside the euro and the eurozone. That, that's one thing. The second thing is the most strategic, the most strategic question you raised, uh, Tarek, which is the question of Europe, actually. Uh, I think those people on the left, you mentioned Negri, but there are many actually, that, that is almost the dominant view actually, that if you are in favour of breaking with that framework, you are supposedly in favour of some regression to the nation state. And this has been demonised. But what this means is that actually, if you think this way, then a real alternative to this existing institution, because it's not about Europe actually, it's about the European Union, so a specific institutional arrangement which is entirely neoliberal in its, in its DNA, actually. And it can't be reformed. We, we see that. that. That's the main lesson, actually, from you know, the Greek government. Even a government which is prepared you know, to play the game within, within it is completely prevented from any kind of break with neoliberalism. So we have to find a way out. And to find a way out, we need an alternative narrative. And I will make a parallel here with the Latin American left, you see. Because the Latin American left has one clear advantage over the European one. They had a clear view that in order to go ahead, they needed forms of regional integration, but clearly al alternative to, do, to the ones that were imposed by the US. So you break with, you know, the free trade agreement, you break with the type of policies that the US government was pushing in the entire American continent, and uh, you have your own alternative. 
the Bolivarian alternative, uh, the, the forms of regional integration of the South American countries and so on. This is the type of alternative perspective that the European left needs if it is serious about breaking with its own, you know, with the subaltern position it, it has found itself now. I agree, but there's, there's so many problems now because it's not just that the European Union is not what we would like it to be. The European Union today is not what its founding fathers imagined it to be. A neutral, sovereign Europe which could deal as equals with both the United States and the Soviet Union. The collapse of the Soviet Union in that whole camp made that particular promise disappear. But still Europe could have behaved as an independent power, but it didn't. So it's ironic that the Germans who themselves do not have full sovereignty, they're occupied by American troops, they're very uh, uh, subordinate to uh, US interests, and after all the fuss of surveillance, Merkel and uh, Schoble have now admitted that yes, they were collaborating with the United States in spying on their own firms and people. So, you know, they are not a sovereign state but they don't want Greece to be a sovereign country either. Uh, it's a sort of strange political, psychological thing. Well, what is sovereignty? Well, we know you're not sovereign, but we also know you want to be sovereign. But why do you stop the Greeks from operating as a sovereign state? And without sovereignty, I mean, democracy is meaningless. That's the other thing we, we witness now, that if... Um, Greece elects a government. The government is elected on the basis of uh, democratic demands. This is why we want to be elected. It's elected and the EU elite says, no, you can't do this. So for me, it's obvious that here it's not a fight between revanchist nationalism and an internationalist EU elite. It's a fight between Greek sovereignty and democracy and a dominant, monolithic, oligarchic European Union. That's the fight, and I think we have to take this fight up because it will affect, it is affecting places uh, 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 in Europe as well. But just to come back to the, the immediate thing, the choice which will be within a few weeks, very clear, capitulation or default. Effectively, what do you think they're going to do? It's, there, it's very difficult to predict, and this is perhaps, you know, it's, it's both, um, um, let's say, good and bad. I mean, it's good because it means that the situation is still open. It is bad because it means that we st still do not have a clear strategic perspective from uh, the side of uh, uh, Greece and, and the government and Syriza, uh, moreover. So at this stage, it's very difficult, I think, to, uh, to make, you know, a kind of forecast. Of, of the situation. But what should be clear is, you know, this kind of international and even internationalist perspective, as you mentioned. Uh, those, you know, who criticized uh, our views, the views of those who were in favor from the outset of the break with the European Union, saying that, you know, it is inevitable if we are serious about breaking with, uh, with austerity. They were saying that, you know, we are abandoning supposedly nationalism because we had, you know, this idea of returning to supposedly to the comfort of, of the nation state. This proved being uh, totally untrue. Actually, Podemos and all the other alternative forces in Europe need actually that break, need the Syriza government to go ahead, to be bold, not to capitulate, and to enter the road of confrontation. And if the government does this, with, of course, the active support and mobilization of the people, uh, then it will open up uh, a new perspective for Europe. And we could say that, you know, the hope that was uh, created with Syriza's victory will not be lost. Statis, thank you. We keep our fingers crossed and we'll talk again. <laughs>